Yes, good afternoon. I'm uh, very curious what the conference on curiosity will be. Um, I don't work on curiosity. Um, I work on award decision making, um, economic, uh, experimental economics, and uh, I'm sorry, I should keep that slide on here. And I wish to thank my collaborators that were part of the data that I'm presenting. And uh, I wish to acknowledge the support um, from what turned out to be a particular local trust, trust absolute, an absolute asset for the research we're doing. Um, I'll talk, as I said, about um, risk, and we'll talk about these two structures, a um, little bit about overflow cortex, and then my uh, structure of addiction, uh, the dopamine system. Um, we realize that um, rewards, usually come in two situations. They are usually typically risky and you're going to make a decision. So you're talking about decision making under risk. Um, we can put up a fancy text if you like. Individuals live in a world of irregular resources which they know incompletely. So things are stochastic and that stochasticity can be simply due to the uh, proper nature true stochastic uncertainty, and it can be because we don't understand the world, um, epistemological uncertainty, to be very global. And the uncertainty in the occurrence of resources constitutes risk. Know all, if you know all the probabilities, and it would be called ambiguity by more strict definitions, if we don't know the probabilities completely. By risk, I mean the variability in the reward. I don't mean necessarily the popular connotation of something being bad or even adverse. Um, uh, this is not just an academic exercise. You can see that every day in the news, everybody makes risky decisions. Just think about the last big decisions in this country and the next big decision coming up in another, another big country. And the question that is, how can we deal with this risk? And uh, can we represent risk in the brain? And can we um, identify how risk affects our decisions? The, uh, if, if you talk these, about these terms, we'd like to have them. decent uh, definitions and I'm all for very simple decisions because whatever I do, when I start out simple, it all becomes complicated at the end. So if I start out complicated, I'll never make it to the end. So Pascal and Framat, when they generated probability theory, they were asked um, what the, pro the practical application is. And they said that you can now, from probability theory, I mean, besides giving information for the insurance companies, um, you can see how, you can understand how people do risk, how, how do risky decisions. They would maximize the so-called expected value of the probability distribution. You'll see that in a second. And um, you can, once you have this definition, you can search for a physical implementation like neurons in the brain that co-risk literally physical implementation of this very conceptual term of risk. There's no such thing in the world where you can measure risk physically. You just have to infer it from the occurrence of events. So rewards are risky because the drop size of liquid that the animal receives at its mouth, if you think of animals, we're going to talk about monkeys, can vary. You can Watch it, you'll see that it varies for a number of reasons. So the, the rewards can vary in size, and as you see, they match up ideally to a nice Gaussian probability distribution. You can define the probability distribution by the sum probability weighted, the uh, sum magnitude weighted by probability called the expected value. And what Gauss and Fermat said is you can explain human decision making by the humans in the typical risky situation preferring pro rewards or outcomes whose probability distribution is a higher expected value compared to everything else. Maximization of expected value was their term. So expected value is what's called the first statistical moment. It's the basic characteristic of a probability distribution. You have, of course, the width of the distribution. How wide is it? And that is the first of risk. 
That means if the distribution is wider, we don't exactly know what we're going to get as next drop of liquid if you're in the Cape Laboratory or if you go out and look at the rain. Um, if, the, if this is wider, the spread is wider, we know much less of what we get. The risk is bigger. And we can define that by the mathematical term of variance, and then that becomes the second, so called second statistical moment of a uh, central moment of a uh, distribution. But of course, uh, distribution can be um, asymmetric. Um, they can have a skew. There can be outliers that have a low probability, but they are much higher than the normal thing. So if you go back to the idea of curiosity, if we are curiosity seeking, we would probably be positive curious seeking. We will look for outliers, for things that don't happen every day, that may be hopefully better, or maybe even worse than the average, much worse than the average. So we're dealing with skewness as a part of the curiosity. Of course, we need other things like novelty, uh, seeking, and so in order to explain curiosity or give a coherent idea about curiosity. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to relate positive skewness, or skewness at all, to curiosity. And that, that is the third term in the probability, statistical term in the probability distribution. And now we can distinguish different so sorts of risk according to just these two, on the second and third moments, just these, these two parameters of variance and, and skewness. And we'll go through that a little bit, mostly about variance, but then at the end a little bit about skewness, and also in relation to the conference. How do we test that in a monkey? How do we test risk in a monkey? We're not going to put what some people are telling us, monkeys at risk. We're simply testing rewards that vary in their magnitude, in a way that is unpredictable, at least partly unpredictable, and that is our, as I said before, what we define risk. And that, that can be different distributions like a symmetric variance or an asymmetric distribution like uh, skewness. We're not going to look at higher moments like protosis or so, getting too complicated. So the um, how we present that to the animal? A simple stimulus, um, the most simple we could find, um, a rectangle and within which a bar has a certain position, and the higher the position, the more reward they get. And if the animal understands this, he would choose the red bar, if he has a choice between these two outcomes. So the two outcomes come up at the screen, the animal makes an eye movement, or joystick movement, or a touch movement, in order to get what it selects. So if it selects the red bar, it will get more than the blue one. And that's in fact what they do. The choice preferences indicate that the animals are understanding these simple stimuli. We see 75, 80, 85% of the choice of the red bar and 25% uh, of the choices at the blue bar. Now monkeys are never completely 100 well hardly ever completely 100 percent one or the other. They always do a little bit of the so-called dominated option. The blue one is the dominated option. It is dominated by the red one. The red one is better. And we, people say that shows how stupid monkeys are, and I say it shows how intelligent monkeys are, because they are doing exploration. They are curious. They want to see if by any chance the blue bar may mean something else today. Although if they've been trained for half a year or a year, they will still go and try out a little bit. This is at least our interpretation. And in terms of what we were before, about softmax functions, and the temperature of soft, or inverse temperature of softmax function, that of course, there is, in curiosity, there would be a lower um, inverse temperature, or higher, higher temperature. Okay, but what we really want to is risk. So the red bar now shows us two outcomes that occur, or well, monkey has to experience that, at 50% probability, either higher or the lower will occur. And the animal has a choice between the blue double bars and the, and the red double bars and the blue bar. So what does that mean? I mean, if you look at it, um, so I can, I can show you that example that works really well. I have um, three 20 pound bills here. And I'll give you the choice between one 20 pound bill, Queen and Adam Smith actually, on one hand, and two 20 pound bills, and you can either get one of them or you can get both. So what would you choose? Well, 
even I would choose between um, 20 pound bills as opposed to the one pound bill. That's called first order stochastic dominance. It's physically better to choose the red double bar than the blue bar or the two, the option where you might get a 50% chance the two $20 pound bills. Um, first order stochastic dominance. Dominance is the most simple test for um, rational, so-called rational choices, although I hate the word. Um, and the reason why people, and many people buy it every day, you can observe it absolutely everywhere once you're sensitive to that. Since I <coughs> learned about that two years ago, I see it absolutely everywhere, every day, with most people actually I know. The reason is not that they don't understand what the trick with 20 pounds. That's easy. Even I can do that. What they don't understand is that maybe the double bar, there is a catch behind, or there's something else. And that's why how irrationality enters. We make stochastically dominated choices. If you choose the blue bar, you actually see the monkey also choose the blue bar a little bit, because it might be something hidden behind, or maybe the red bar. There's another trick that you haven't experienced yet or so. And I can, I can even get wives, bankers, making a dominated choice here. In this case, it was quite, uh, quite interesting. Anyway, um, monkeys can follow first order stochastic dominance on average, and here is an example, what I just showed, and here is another example in which the um, red bar is again better in this case because the blue bar can be worse or equal, but it will never be better than the um, red bar. So you're going to choose, of course, um, the red bar. And so do the neurons, and that's my point now. Dopamine neurons are respecting first order stochastic dominance. It's a very simple thing, but it shows that the animals have understood the past, the behavior works, that they make rational choices, and the neurons follow that. So everything is basically the way we want it. Okay? So let's get some explicit risk signals. We're using the most simple risk test that we can have. We're not testing safe against risky. That is a very bad risk test because it confounds a number of parameters. We're testing small against large risk. We keep the mean, the expected value, absolutely identical. There is no um, skewness in it. And the probability distortion, which may occur at 50% probability, is very minor and is certainly symmetric. So we have a very well defined risk test. And it's not just our invention. Well, it was actually our invention until we realized that because we're looking for something that this has been invented before by Joseph Stiglitz and Michael Rothschild. Um, and that is not just for academic gain. Uh, as you see, uh, Joe Stiglitz um, was the a scientific advisor to the World Bank. Risk, of course, is a major um, problem in international trade. And uh, having been able to define mathematical proofs and everything, that that is the most simple form of risk and the most simple variation of risk has probably had a major impact on his general decisions about running or giving advice to the World Bank. Okay, so it's not just joking that we're doing here, that there may be a practical application. So let's do that. Let's do that test. Let's take a small risk, intermediate risk, and large risk. We're talking about variance risk now. And we see that neurons in the orbital cortex are more activated. Actually, there is a light red trace here which you cannot see. I realize that. So there are three sort of, um, levels of neural responses, all of them, and, and they, they reflect exactly in monotonic fashion these three risk levels. And these, the same type, group of neurons in the orbital frontal cortex, in this area here, are not coding the value if we, in, if we test the algorithm with three different um, levels of value in individual trials. Right? So every one of these traces here corresponds to one of these three stimuli. Um, if we then have another group of neurons, they are not coding the risk because they're kind of varying in random order. The light of the red is not this literally. And, but they're coding nicely in the blue, the, the, the value. So we get distinct groups, and here are the regressions for that. We're getting distinct groups of neurons that code risk is the most simple form of variance risk and, and, and value in the order of the context. So we do have an explicit risk signal the brain is actually following this theoretical construct of variance risk and sort of mean preserving spread um, in the neurons. This is reassuring. We're not testing something completely exotic.
All right. Well, here are the regression results. There are almost no overlap in these two types of errors. Okay. Um, and we're getting a risk prediction error signal. I don't have the time to go through that. We simply define a risk prediction error be, um, as the difference between the actual risk, that's this stimulus here that indicates the risk, and the prediction of the risk from the past history. We can run a reinforcement model of risk uh, with this, and then we present the reward, and that's a, a safe outcome here. So the risk prediction error actually occurs at this time and not at the time of the reward. And uh, we can uh, define the risk prediction error, we can draw it up. I'm not going to through the details spending too much time on this. And, uh, and then we see that the neurons are coding, some order of the neurons are coding the risk prediction error in the rectified form, we didn't see the unrectified. And, uh, and this risk coding is separate in the regression from the, the risk prediction error signal is separate from the risk coding in these neurons. So we get two groups of risk coding neurons in the orbital cortex, the straight risk variance risk coding in this case, at least that's what we tested, and the variance risk prediction error. Um, the second thing is that risk affects the subjective value of the outcome. <coughs> That's an easy term. So what does it mean? We're looking at a utility function. Utility function is the most basic mathematical function in economics that defines the subjective value that a subject places into outcomes, particular outcomes. Everybody has a different utility function, and the utility function may be different, may differ between different goods. Okay? So the prototypical so-called well-behaved utility function is concave, and you can draw from that the risk attitude of the individual subject. So you give the subject a choice between five pounds outcome for sure, or a gamble between one pound and nine pound, 50% outcome each, which has the same expected value, right? So you compare a gamble against the same uh, outcome. Um, just to make it very simple. And uh, what we're getting is we plot the utility of these outcomes, and we see that if the subject gets the top outcome, he will have a bit more than the same outcome, that's fine. But when he gets the bottom outcome, he will lose quite a lot against the same outcome. So if you lose a lot against the safe outcome and the gain doesn't count that much, you of course are risk seeking, are risk avoiding, you want to save outcome. Opposite with the convex function, in which um, the, the small amounts don't count, these, the bigger um, rewards count much more, and you are risk seeking because if you win relative to the utility of the safe outcome, you will win much more than what you lose when you get the low outcome. So this individual would be risk seeking. And I'll show you that monkeys have a mixture of risk seeking and risk avoidance. Okay. The most interesting thing with utility, besides these very simple uh, explanations, is that a single utility function can predict the attitude independently to various forms of risk. So I can draw this very simple, this is no higher mathematics than high school. I can draw, in this case, a gamble with three outcomes, these three blue lines. And then I can draw a gamble that is more risky, mean preserving spread, the red one. And we, when we draw, draw that on the utility function, get the utility, we see that the blue gamble has a higher utility, expected utility, than the um, red gamble. Okay? So the subject would be variance risk avoiding. If you plot a um, skewed gamble, this would be the positive skewness, and that would be the negative skewness. If you plot these gambles on here, we calculate the expected utility, we see that in fact the red gamble now um, has a higher expected utility. You would say that the subject would be um, various risk avoidance, avoiding, which I showed before. It would be positive skewness risk seeking, because this is what you're seeing right here. And of course, it would avoid negative skewness risk. That's the same thing as positive skewness risk. Okay? So three different forms of risk attitude encapsulated, encapsulated predicted by the utility function. Okay, so here we do that. We, we want to establish a utility function. We take, again, this uh, situation in the safe against the risky outcome. We vary the safe outcome. We keep the risk constant, the risk outcome constant. This is our gamble between 0.1 and 0.4 milliliters of juice, 50% each. The expected value is right in between. And then we vary the blue one blue outcome from the bottom, then we won't choose the blue one, then we go higher, and then at some point the other will choose both of these options frequently, 
e e equally frequently, 50% in difference, that's here, and then when you keep growing the blue one, then the other one will choose the blue one even more. The important point is our 50% in difference, that's where both, both outcomes have the same value, so we can read now, in the safe outcome, how much the gamma is worth in terms of the safe outcome. That's called the certainty equivalent. And we see that the certainty equivalent is actually higher than the expected value. That means the animal draws more value out of the gamble than from the safe outcome. This animal is risk seeking in this area. Now, if we do the same exact thing with the gamble, the same gamble, but move it higher, then we see with the same psychophysics technique that the certainty equivalent is lower. That means the animal is risk avoiding at higher outcomes. That sounds very strange, but it's true. It seems to be true if you do a utility function now, which will show exactly the same. To get a utility function as a particular very simple procedure, get, by doing, doing these um, certain equivalents in a particular structural form called the fractile or chain procedure by Caracol 1980 and Machina 1987, we can construct, um, do these gambles here, same outcome against the gambles, that's the indifference point. Then we take this as the anchor and uh, make another gamble out of this. This is the indifference point here, and we keep doing this, and then we get a utility. That's a utility function. It's not a sacrificial function. This is initially convex, then linear, and then concave, corresponding to initial risk seeking, just as we see here, and later with higher uh, outcomes as risk avoiding, as we see it here. So these things correspond. We're not just getting any data, we're getting data that, that makes sense and are mutually compatible. Okay? Um, let's go back uh, to our true risk test where we have a real nice risk um, choice between two, two risk outcomes. Um, this is our utility function that we just do. We place two gambles on it and get the expected utility. That means the expected utility is of course in, exactly in between the symmetric gambles between the utility top outcome and the utility at the bottom outcome. And for the red gamble, if you place it over the whole function here, we see that the expected utility is higher overall. That means the animal in the overall thing is risk seeking because this seems to be much stronger than the sort of risk avoidance area here. So, what do the neurons do? The neurons, oh, oh sorry, we, we see this. We, we, no, okay, okay, I have to be slow. I have to talk like an economist. You take a utility function from the number of gambles. You use a totally different gamble, or two different gambles, what I'm just doing now, and you want to see what the expected value is, what the expected utility is, and then you want to predict from that expected utility the animal's choices. That shows whether or not the utility function can predict the choices or the choice preferences that we infer from the choices. And what we see it works. It works that the animal, when the Gamble has a high expected utility, the animal prefers this gamble. You see that this is um, not a 100, 100 to 0 choice. There is a lot of a dominated outcome, but that's okay. I mean, I mentioned before that the animals are exploring, the difference is not all that big. Um, anyway, and the neurons do exactly the same thing. The, the neurons are, have a higher response to the red gamble that has a higher expected utility. That's the gamble. Exactly those gambles here that we're using and have a lower response to the lower expected utility gamble. Now, this is still a ranking situation. We know that higher response to higher gamble, we don't know how much um, the, uh, the, the, the value that comes out of that um, is, well, we, we can see it from the expected utility, and then, of course, as the functions are common, we can get that, but we can't get it from this here. So we need a more coherent test. Okay? What we really need to do is we have to test the dopamine neurons over the whole utility range, not just with a couple of gamblers. And what we this is our utility function again. A linear coding, a linear coding of value and utility would be the sort of line. This is our utility function. And when I show you the response to the free reward, the free reward elicits by definition a positive reward prediction error to which dopamine neurons show an activation. And we see very nicely that the neural response does not follow the linear line here, the line, 
but it, it starts very slow, just like utility function, and then it exaggerates, and then it goes high, and it almost asymptotes. It's not necessarily a linear coding, which you didn't even, even expect that in your eyes, but uh, you have a coding that looks very suspiciously similar to this utility function. So we conclude tentatively that the dopamine neurons are coding um, utility and not physical value. That means dopamine neurons are not interested in the um, physical amount in the milliliters. Of course, they play a role, but they're not alone interested in that. They're interested in how much that contributes to the utility. And this is not just a, a um, subjective value coding, because subjective value coding does not need this utility function. This is far more strict a definition of the neural coding in the dopamine neurons by following the, uti the whole utility function as defined by the economists. If that is actually true, we should see that similar coding with true gammas. Thank you. The, the whole the utility functions um, were, were um, established under a risk. There is a, a, a very nice book, very nice, very, very important book by Norman Rockstar in 1944, in which they established five uh, or four utility axioms uh, under risk. And with these utility axioms, one can conclude that somebody who fulfills the axiom is utility maximizer. And in that case, one can generate numeric or, to be precise, cardinal utility. Okay, so we need a gamble. We need to do this in gambles in order to fulfill the conditions under which one can assess utility functions. So let's do gambles. So, as you've seen, um, dopamine neurons are coding a reward prediction error. They're not just coding an increase in reward. They code a reward prediction error. If the reward is better than predicted, they have activation. If the reward is worse than predicted, they have a depression activity. And we'll use this for the gambles. So what we do is our utility function, we place three gambles that are identical in their spread, but they, uh, they come at different positions in the utility function. So these gambles are always 0.3 milliliters. The positive prediction error would always be 0.15 milliliters physically, but the utility prediction error, if we map the x-axis onto the y-axis, the difference in utility is different because the function has different steepness. At the steepest part, the utility prediction error is the highest. At the flatter part, the utility prediction error is less. So are the neurons now holding the physical prediction error, in which case the response should be absolutely the same because these are three variables. The prediction error is always, the positive prediction error is always 0.15 milliliters, or are they coding the utility prediction error, in which case they should have a non-monotonic um, inverse in shape response, and that's what we see. We see very nicely that the response here to the larger utility prediction error, despite the gamma being the same, is larger here than to the smaller utility prediction error. Okay, so it seems that the dopamineers are coding a utility prediction error as the best definition of subjective values. Okay, um, back to just one slide. Um, uh, Skewness. The, this is now not an animal. The animal has a slightly different utility function. There's also a different movement involved. Um, and uh, we want to see if that utility function now can also predict what I claimed conceptually in the beginning, um, preferences under choices, under skews. So we plot negative, a negative skewed gamble on the utility function. We plot a positively skewed um, gamble with the, the red one on the utility function. We see that the positively skewed gamble has a higher utility. In that case, the animal should prefer if the utility function is a valid predictor of choices, the possibly skewed gamble, and indeed it does, not very much, but you also see that the difference in expected utility is not terribly high. Okay, it works. We have done many tests in several in two animals with the, uh, with the uh, skewness in a retrograde. And then, of course, we want to do a bit more testing, we want to be persuaded that this is not just a chance result but by testing transitivity. We see that the positively skewed over the non-skewed gamma with the same variant, the same expected value, with everything constant, we vary only this one parameter, that there is a 65 or 60 percent choice of the red gamma here. When we then take that gamma over the negatively skewed gamma, we see another 60 percent chance, a, a, a preference for this gamma, 
and when we do the transitivity test, we test the red one or the blue one, we see that the preference is even better, it's so-called strong transitivity according to the definition of this preference, the, the choice probability being higher here compared to any of the other choices. Okay, so the utility function indeed in our hands, in our monkeys, um, can predict the choices the monkeys have over weekends and we didn't work with them, have read the textbooks and they know what they're doing. Okay, just one more slide for the sake of the conference. I put that in just half an hour ago um, about, about curiosity and novelty seeking. It's, it's very interesting. Um, this is conceptually farther out. We know that the probabilities are translated in dopamine neurons and in other reward neurons into value. Uh, Steve Kennedy has shown that it's not the case for all orbitofrontal neurons. They can co probability and act separately. But we, we know at least in dopamine neurons that they kind of put them together into a code which we now know is expected utility. So if these uh, experiences occur in rewards, we, we can draw a predictive utility measure out of it. The, the, utility, uh, the probability predicts how often this event will occur on average. We can put that into our dopamine system and see that we have a learning circuit uh, that will um, learn from the experience frequency and translate that into a predictive probability. Um, it does work. We, we try the behavior. So here, be very specific. Um, we have a familiar stimulus that always presents 0.5 probability of reward. They are all the same magnitude, but then there are three novel stimuli which we change all the time, every day, even several times. One stimulus, which Alma doesn't know, produces three quarters reward, one stimulus produces reward every second time, and one stimulus produces reward in one out of four times. Right? And then the animal has a choice between one of these stimuli, novel stimuli, against the old stimulus. Right? So he has a reference, he can compare. But what does the animal do? Well, that's the point. Here. The animals in the beginning always, I'm sorry, they always choose the novel stimulus. Of course they're dead bored by that stupid stimulus that they have seen for half a year or a year. But they always, without, well not always, but 90%, here in this case 100%, choose novel stimuli, and then that will go down after subsequent sessions, the session is maybe a hundred trials or so, and then it will go down, and then it will become graded according to the probability, exactly the way we think one should behave. The animal chooses more frequently the high reward, high frequent, high probability stimulus, the less frequently the low probability stimulus, and the novel 50% probability stimulus is chosen approximately as frequently as this known 50% probability stimulus. And the neurons show something very interesting, very similar. We know that the neurons um, have a novelty response. We're just starting, starting to understand it. It's the first component of a two-component response. And we see that novelty response immediately after the stimulus here, and that novelty response goes down with successive trials. Even in 30 trials, it goes down, and it is inconspicuously different. Um, between these different probabilities. Then there is a second, as you can see here, a second peak, and that peak is the value signal. So it takes the neurons, maybe 300 milliseconds, to figure out the value during this complicated learning situation, and that value signal starts out inconspicuously similar, and then it deviates according to these different probabilities. So what I'm trying to say is that there is a novelty seeking in the monkeys that's absolutely amazing these animals, and if you know the animals, you see the animals in the animal house, they are literally novelty seeking. When I go with the visitor in the animal house, they don't look at me, they look at the novel visitor without fault. And that's not only just because they hate me, they actually don't hate me, but they do that with absolutely everybody. Everybody complains, the monkey never looks at me because this other guy goes in and why is he better looking than I am? So everybody is annoyed, but the monkey is novelty seeking. Okay? And, uh, well, that's a detail about chosen value for people that are interested in decision models. Okay. So what I tried to tell you is that uh, risk is in here a feature of reward, and we can have very simple mathematical definitions that monkeys understand and even I understand. The economic utility function predicts specific risk preference. That's what I tried to show from the beginning. The preference of monkey follow basic assumptions of economic decision theory, probability, risk, and first, second, third order stochastic dominance. So the gamblers are defined 
but they are st by their properties, which can be uh, ex uh, expressed as second, first, second, and third order stochastic dominance. First order is higher value, second is higher variance, seeking or, or, or avoiding, and uh, third is skewness. Okay, the, the neurons show this. Um, the, the, uh, the behavior shows that the neurons show uh, compliance with first and second order gamma uh, stochastic dominance. Risky gammas can be used to estimate the numeric cardinal utility function and establish a normal utility coding. So our global reward prediction error um, is now specified as utility prediction error because the word reward is basically does not define how you code the value, whether you code it in objective value or subjective value or in this mathematical form of utility. This is what the neurons are doing, and reward neurons and human goal signals implement these well conceptual theoretical constructs. They compress and integrate it into utility. I didn't show the both signals. We don't have set that much advanced data on human both signals, but we do know that humans are risk seeking and that some uh, both signals are actually reflected risk seeking. Thank you very much.
So regarding the utility curve issue, so the convex to con concave, the changes about like a point eight millimeter. But the, how stable is that the utility curve? How, how, how stable is the UTT curve? Stable. Uh, uh, stable. Yeah, when regarding the quality of the animal, and also if you change the amplitude of the reward, the average amplitude is shifted per trial. Yeah. It, it, it is stable if you keep the conditions stable. There is some variation, um, which we think is more the statistical variation, but we see a systematic change when we increase the effort. That means what I showed you was what I move, except the, the utility function with the skewness, and that was the joystick. And we had initially a joystick that was pretty hard, and then the utility function was bad, and then came up at about 0.9 milliliters. And then, then I realized that the monkey has very thin muscles here, very thin. The forearm muscles are super thin, they're very elegant arms, but very thin muscles. So I mean, immediately reduce the joystick. Um, uh, and then we saw that because the utility function was very funny and the utility function moved to the left and then another guy just said nah, I'm going to rip out, there's a spring that puts the joystick there, I'm going to rip out the, the spring and see what happens and sure enough the utility function um, went even further to the left we have difficulties calibrating the utility vertically with different loads so we never published this but uh, we see a very systematic change so we think that the utility function actually that, um, reflects not just the income reward, um, but the so called net benefit. That means the income minus, let's call it the effort cost or something. So it's an integrated utility that we see. We have not tested that in the neurons, but in the behavior we see that. So it, it's very systematic. It's, it's amazing. Um, thank you. I think maybe we should uh, say the questions for the discussion. Thank you for fascinating.